We're joined by defence analyst Helmut Hietman. Helmut, good afternoon and thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon. Pleasure. No, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Now, definitely devastating news coming out of the DRC, even though we know there's always that strong likelihood of loss of life in combat. But just your views on the attack. I think they, they're basically feeling out the SANDF contingent in particular to see how serious we are. Are they going, are they going to follow up on this aggressively and find the mortar team and take them on? Or are they going to sit back and not do much about it? They, they don't know yet just how aggressive the, the SADC deployment will be, and specifically SANDF, which is the largest component. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's not a surprising tactic to do that. Mm -hmm. But now for the benefit of those who might not have a full appreciation of the terrain, paint us a picture of what our troops alongside the Congolese forces are actually dealing with when it comes to their adversary M23 in its current form. Okay, it's difficult. M23 are, I, I presume, I'm trying to believe it, the Rwandan-backed irregular forces or guerrillas. They are backed by the Rwandans because the Rwandans still are concerned about guerrilla attacks from former Rwandan army and into the Hamways, people living in the DRC. M23 under previous names too have been active in that area in a guerrilla capacity for over 20 years. Mm. They know the terrain backwards. They, uh, you know, they've, they've been around long enough. They know it. They know the local people as well to an extent. Um, they apparently have the backing of the Rwandan military, which is a very serious professional military with some good equipment. The terrain is difficult. There are not many roads. And without without transport helicopters, for it's very difficult to move troops around quickly. There are a lot of hills, so it's again a base is often overlooked by high ground somewhere else, which makes life more difficult. The civilian population is all over, so it's it's again you know we want to immediately shoot back, but then you might get some civilians. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a difficult situation. The mm -hmm. primary problem is that the the SADC mission is far too small to do the job. You know, Monasco was 13,500, previously 15,000 troops couldn't do it. What makes anybody think 5,000 can do it? Mm -hmm. And, and the fact that they're downscaling. Because of funding issues. So clearly the downscaling of yeah, the UN's mission, that... Monasco, is really fundamentally impacting yeah. the fight there. It will. I mean, it's a big encouragement, not just to M23, but to this whole bunch of more than 100 different armed, illegal armed groups that are floating around that part of the DRC. Um, some pro-government, some anti-government, some actually just criminal elements. Mm -hmm. With the with Monosco scaling down and the DRC's own security forces pretty ineffective, the situation is likely to flare up. The funny thing is that it's the DRC government that has asked the UN to pull Monosco out. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a bit confusing. One the, wonders. The East African contingent that was there. there. Mm -hmm. One wonders what look, is their view now because. Because you've been talking of this sophisticated weaponry and even mentioned Rwanda's role in all of this. So, I mean, honestly speaking, with what we know on the side of the South African troops and Congolese, there are serious capability gaps. Just simple aircrafts are not enough. So, honestly, can they win this battle? Uh, straightforward answer, no. The, you, want to do, you want to stabilize the east of the DRC, you need to put about 20,000 troops in there with lots of air support, you need to stay there for 10 years. Um, UN was there for 20 years, but the, the force was too weak. It had very little air support, it didn't have heavy weapons, it had fairly tight rules of engagement, and just achieved nothing. Bear in mind, it's not just M23, it's all those other irregular forces there, the Allied Democratic Forces that launch attacks into Uganda from there. They are Burundi guerrilla groups. Some of these, like the ADF, have been living in the east of the DRC for more than 20 years. They have intermarried locally, they're now part of the local furniture. So wonderful early warning systems through the local population. They know the terrain backwards, just like M23 does. Um, so it's a very complex situation. There are also a lot of, quite a lot of criminal groups, smuggling groups operating there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very complex. And I'm baffled by the, the DRC government's decision to pull Monasco out, unless they simply don't want the East to become stable, because far too many people of all sides are making too much money. Mm. But surely they would want some level of stability because right now we heard that they're advancing into Goma, so it's quite a problem if they even take over Sake. Look, yeah, it, it, is, it is strange. The, the DRC government's attitude is strange. One of the issues, I suppose, been the, the local population in the east of DRC have been protesting against Monasco for not stabilizing the area. 
that quite honestly, Monosco simply didn't have the number of troops to do the job. Mm -hmm. And some of the contingents weren't very active, if you want to be honest about that. The, the most active has been the South African element. Um, I know two Monosco force commanders said the only battalion they'd be prepared to enter a war with was a South African one. The South Africans are particularly well once against M23 when the Royal Falk attack helicopters were available. But now there are no Royal Falk attack helicopters available. I'm not sure if any of the other SADC countries are providing air support. Mm -hmm. But it looks as if this SADC contingent is going to have no air support worth mentioning. And that makes life even more difficult and makes the troops very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Now, in South Africa, that conversation around our capabilities is one that is obviously gaining momentum, and rightfully so. But it seems the message around our regional obligations, around peacekeeping, are being forgotten somehow, especially now that we speak of the withdrawal of the UN's peacekeeping mission, MONUSCO. So can you just perhaps talk us through what should happen at this point? That it's a given MONUSCO is withdrawing, what should happen then? Well, I mean, ideally, Monosco shouldn't withdraw. But given that that's going to happen, the SADC should either decide to put a much much stronger force in there and find the money to do it. I mean, for instance, Angola has got the largest air force and army in, in the SADC, and they don't seem to be coming to the party at all. Um, or say, sorry, guys, nothing we can do about it. I'll leave you to it. There is actually a, th a sort of theory in, in, in strategic circles that says that peacekeeping operations very often do nothing but extend and intensify a, com a, con a conflict mm. and the underlying hostilities. And certainly, if, if you put in too small a force, you achieve very little. Um, all you're doing, you're going to kill some people, you're going to lose some people, and what do you achieve? I think the, the problem with the broader SADC, most of the armed forces are weak. Angola is an exception. The others are weak because the countries are small and the economies are weak. The SANDF, unfortunately, has been essentially run into the ground with underfunding and overstretch. Not the fault of the people in it. There's nothing much wrong with our soldiers. They've done well in every operation. But without the equipment, without the money to operate the equipment and become really proficient with it, you can't do the job. So it's very much a decision time for the SADC and South Africa. Either do it properly or don't do it at all. Hmm. I mean, we saw the same in Cabo Delgado and Mozambique. The force that went in was too small, no air support, has basically failed, now they want to withdraw. Hmm. What a dismal um, picture you paint. That's particularly strange because that's a threat. Hmm. So Sorry, it seems again. as though we're overstretching ourselves because you're painting a very dismal picture. Look, we are. I mean, the, the army has a total strength of 30-something thousand. About half of them are infantry. They've got, they're going to now have 2,900, it's mainly army, in the Congo. I don't know that we can really afford to withdraw from, from Mozambique, so that'll be another one and a half thousand. There's about 2,700 involved in border patrol. 3,300 tracing the Zamas Zamas, and almost 900 deployed to protect power stations. The army has got nothing much left to give. You know, troops can't be left there forever. They have to be rotated. They have to be retrained. Um, the army basically is, is now fully stretched, in fact, overstretched. The Air Force can't support it because it hasn't been given the money to maintain its aircraft. So what we're doing is we, we're, sitting, we're trying to play a regional role with the defense force that we're only funding up to a sort of border guard level. And that is deeply irresponsible of government.